I think it takes like an hour to reach Jericho. This is the first starting like border with the Palest- like Palestinian like crossing. So we we pass by three crossings. Mm-hmm. So the first one is the Palestinian one in Jericho. Mm-hmm. And then we go by the Israeli and then the last one, Jordan. Mm-hmm. So we cross three borders to enter uh, Jordan. This is not to forgive, but to understand. I am your host, Luis Gonzalez Aponte. As usual, I am joined by my co-host, writer and scholar of genocide studies, Saba Karim. We are pleased to welcome Zuki Svavana, speaking to us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Zuki Svavana is an acclaimed writer, publisher, curator, and editor. Since her debut novel, The Madams, published in 2006, she has consistently captivated readers with her storytelling. Notably, her novel, London Cape Town Joburg, earned her the prestigious Cavilla Sello Ducker Memorial Literary Award in 2015. In November 2023, Vanna released a collection of essays entitled Vignettes of a People in an Apartheid State, reflecting on what she witnessed in Palestine during her visit in May 2023 for the Palestine Festival of Literature. Beyond her literary achievements, Zuki Svav's activism and commitment to social justice are evident in her bold actions, such as returning the Goethe Medal in protest against the German government's role in the Gaza conflict. With a rich repertoire of works spanning fiction, nonfiction, and children's literature, Zuki Svav continues to be a leading voice in African literature, inspiring readers and writers alike. We are pleased to have her with us today. Welcome, Zuki Svav. Thank you, Louis. How are you? Doing well, thank you very much. So I would like to go ahead and start with the returning of the Goethe Medal. So in 2020, you became the first woman from the African continent to receive the Goethe Medal. Previously, Ian McKeown and Museum Director Elvira Espero Aika were also awarded it. And yet, just a few weeks ago, you returned the Goethe Medal, citing the German government's role in the ongoing war in Gaza as your reason. You said, and I quote, the German government would acknowledge that never again meant never again for anybody. Now, there have been several instances where writers and cultural figures have taken action in response to Germany's stance uh, on the Israel-Gaza conflict, specifically a campaign backed by the French author and Nobel Prize winner Annie Ebnot and Palestinian poet Mohamed el Tut, where more than 500 global artists, filmmakers, writers, and culture, cultural workers have launched a campaign against Germany's policies alleging suppression of freedom of expression related to solidarity with Palestine. Suki Sva, please tell us more about your decision to return the Goethe Medal, and especially what you realized during your trip to Palestine to visit the Palace, Palestine Festival of Literature in May 2023. Uh, well, returning the medal was a very easy thing for me because finding out uh, something which I put in the statement that Germany was one of the biggest, uh, one of the two biggest funders uh, of weapons to Israel. Despite the fact that they themselves have a history of genocide, uh, not just in, uh, not just the Holocaust, but in Namibia and in Tanzania, yeah, yeah, in Africa. So, seeing them again being complicit in another genocide when they should have been the first people who said, no, 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 no. we're not going to abet and be okay with this particular genocide, particularly after the ICJ ruling, uh, uh, provisional ruling, which found, you know, um, Israel's actions, essentially saying Israel is, is, is complicit in a genocide. So, yeah. Um, and, of course... This was not only um, pushed on me by having experienced uh, Palestine when I went there last year, uh, which was where I saw, you know, as a South African, I know apartheid, and apartheid was pretty bad. Uh, I didn't, I didn't grow up here, fortunately, but I came towards the end of apartheid. But still, I experienced some of it. And so when you get into Palestine, it's worse than any apartheid that I'd ever heard of. Uh, Palestinians use different roads. They have different number plates. So Israelis have white number, uh, yellow number plates. Palestinians have white number plates. Yellow number plates can go anywhere. White number plates are restricted on where they can go. In certain areas, Palestinians cannot uh, put a water tank 
at their places. And this is part of the reason why we're seeing Gaza now. In Gaza, people are unable to have water because they're not allowed to have to have water. According to the Israeli government, even rainwater is considered belongs to the Israelis. Um, Palestinians are not allowed to put solar panels in their house without Israeli permission. And that's essentially the basis. I remember entering um, some space and I could go. I could go and the writers that I traveled with, because during the time that I was in Palestine, we went to uh, when Ramallah, when East Jerusalem, we're in um, uh, Lid, when Hebron, when uh, I went to uh, Bethlehem as well. But we could go into certain spaces that Palestinians could not, you know, with our foreign passports. How does anybody not see that as problematic? So just a point of correction, my book actually came out in October 2023. So it was, I wrote, it's, it's, it's a little essay, actually. I, I wouldn't really call it a book, but it's on Amazon, and it's in a few countries, and it's been translated into uh, uh, Portuguese and into uh, Spanish in Colombia and so forth and so on. Portuguese in Brazil uh, and Spanish in Colombia and uh, French in Tunisia, and it's now in progress and uh, as a, an Arabic translation in Algeria, which is really to say that at this point in time, I feel like the global South is having a more moral conversation than those who claimed that they had moral rights in global North. And of course, the signatories of um, um, the UN Charter back in 1945 1948, rather. I'm curious, can you give our audience a little bit more into this, um, the vignettes of a people in an apartheid state? You you called it an essay, or is it a collection of essays? Is it um, involving more creative writing, or is it no, more nonfiction accounts? No, no, it's actually a long, uh, a long form essay. So it's about 9,000 to 10,000 words. And um, as I mentioned, uh, at least I know the, the English and the Portuguese versions are on Amazon available. Um, but it's it's really like my kind of diary of traveling through Palestine and what I was feeling at that very moment every time that I was there and how it messed me up, you know, where you realize I don't think anybody can go to Palestine and still be okay afterwards, you know, and, and, and still be okay with the idea of uh, Israel and, and the treatment of Palestinians. I don't think it's possible. Um, Zukiswa, I, I want to also touch on something. Uh, one of in our one of our, our guests in a former episode uh, talked about in detail how um, they were made to tour Jerusalem. So they were invited as a scholar to tour Jerusalem. And when they toured Jerusalem uh, by helicopter, they were given the perspective of how the Israelis are a victim rather than a perpetrator of what's going on over there. Did you imagine this sort of like scenario playing out that what if you were invited by the Israelis to view that part of the city instead of being invited by the, by the Palestinians. So to start with, it would be very ridiculous to go on a helicopter because that's not how uh, Palestinians are allowed to access anything, you know. So that in itself is already levels of ridiculous. Uh, but secondly, listen, if the narrative you're going to pull is you've got a bunch of not only Europeans and and uh, Americans, but equally white South Africans uh, moving 
to this alleged promised land that already has people, by the way, that only became a territory because some British guy called Balfour did a Balfour declaration. Let's understand that particular history. That's your level of colonialism, and we're not, we need to ground it in that. If you're going to have that, right now, a South African who is African Kana, who decides to convert to Judaism today, will go into Israel and they will be given land. And they can, they can push out a Palestinian whose grandfather has had, um, you know, this olive tree that has grown, an olive grove that has grown in their field for the last 300 years. They can uh, push these people out from their homes. Also, we also, everybody needs to understand, let's not conflate Judaism with Zionism. It's not the same thing. You know, the person who did the cover of my book of Vignettes of an Apartheid State is actually Jewish. But her, her grandfather was a strong proponent and anti-Zionist already in the 20s, in the 1920s, you know. And, and, and there are a lot. Here in South Africa, we've got a lot of Jewish people who are anti-Zionism, you know. Uh, I think of people like Kada Small. I think of people like uh, Jonathan Shapiro and so forth. And I'm, I might not always agree with them on all their politics. But on this one, I'm like, if a Jewish person is telling you that, no, we fought against apartheid in South Africa, and what we're seeing in Israel is actually another form of apartheid, then, yeah, please believe them. You know, Germany itself, and I mentioned this in my statement when I was heading back the medal, 30% of the artists they have banned uh, for speaking up against against them and against against Israel. 30% of them have been Jewish. Duki Sa, I'd like to, or we would like to now play a short video still in relation to this Palestine conflict with Israel. This video that Sabah and I recorded just a few days ago, we would like to hear your comments, especially with regard to the role of literature and creative writing in the context. We are here to speak to Lama today. Lama and I crossed paths in Austin, Texas a while ago. Lama is Palestinian and a few days ago while speaking to her, I found out about a very particular dish that she and her siblings enjoy together. And while she was telling me about it, she started to recount its history and I was very intrigued by what she had to say. Lama, we will play an audio of your grandmother who we we call Teta, uh, which means grandmother in Arabic. We will play this recording that you have of her recounting how this part of history and politics has become intertwined with the dish that you told me about. <laughs> عشان تاكلوا تاكلوا اكلتم هذا يا ستي يا ستي الله يضعك ملي باكل بخلص صحنه بمرك عن الجسر عشان تروحوا على الاردن yeah so it's basically a lentil soup mixed with the dried ملوخيه i don't know what's in english <laughs> so they mix it and they like we eat it usually with the bread so young kids don't like it so much because it's not like something that they used to make. It's not a very like common. It's not. It's not the most favorite. It's like spinach, right? Was it uh, like mulukhia? No, it's uh, similar to spinach. Yeah, I mean, not all the, uh, not all Palestinian make this dish. So, and actually, it has a name called bisara. So, if you Google like bisara, and then you can find the recipe of that dish. But Teta used to call it. Tabikh al-Malik, which is like literal translation of the meal of the king. Mm -hmm. And she refers to the king, to the king of Jordan. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, she was telling us that if you eat this, you will uh, the, the king will, will allow you to, to cross the border to Jordan. And so when we were kids, we could spend like days on the border. And then also it was a journey because we go to visit my aunt who, lived th who lives there. So she was trying to say that in a way to encourage us to eat. So this is like a dish. If you eat it, then you will go like to uh, without, any without any problems. Just for our audience to understand exactly, you were in Palestine. Can you tell us the places, that location that you were in Palestine? So Teta lives in Salfit, which is a city near Nablus. And I live in Ramallah, so I used to go visit her on the weekends. And then like going to to Jordan, I think it takes like an hour to reach Jericho. This is the first starting like border with the Palest like Palestinian like crossing. So we we pass by three crossings. Mm -hmm. So the first one is the Palestinian one in Jericho. Mm -hmm. And then we go by the Israeli and then the last one, Jordan. Mm -hmm. So we cross three borders to enter uh, Jordan. So what is the importance of Jordan? And again, this is for our audience to really understand the dynamics there. What is the importance of Jordan to Palestinians in terms of its gateway to the rest of the world or mm. it's the, the, the importance of it with respect to travel? We're very, like, we're neighbor countries and we, we consider ourselves as, like, one country so we we used to like it's a, there is a common common statement uh which is about like sha'ab wahad which is which means like we're one one nation yeah we're one nation mm -hmm. so we we are one nation not two mm -hmm. so we are very culturally mutual and then we have very similar like uh, food, dialects, like the way how we, we dress. So the dish uh, basically uh, was about if you eat this, you will <laughs> you, you be able to go all the way to Jordan. And of course, you wanted to go to Jordan because that was considered to be a better place to be at. It's not a better place. It's a, like, it's our, as you mentioned earlier, it's our, like, gate to the world. So if I, if I have to go, for example, to like Dubai because I, I was li I was I used to live there so I had to go through Jordan and use the the airport to fly out to uh, Dubai or wherever like Turkey or even the very like neighboring close uh, countries because remind us <clears throat> that the airports in Palestine were actually bombed correct could you tell no, us about that not, uh, yeah the, the the old the old one yeah but like the, the now, the Ben Gurion yeah. uh, like airport, airport it, it used to call Lid Airport. And it was like previously, it was a Palestinian airport that they used to like to travel. But now it is like under, like it's in Tel Aviv, it's under the Israeli control. So I cannot go and travel through that airport. I have to go. To, the, to Jordan, to cross the borders and go to Jordan to travel. Do you remember other examples of how the politics of the country have become part of your vocabulary or the everyday language that you use or the comments that you make? Like other examples that you would like to share? So my uncle used to go to Birzeit University from Ramallah to Birzeit town, which is around like 15 minutes by car. But he, in the middle, uh, like specifically in Surda, ta which is a very small town between Birzeit and Ramallah, he had to stop to ride on a donkey uh, cart to cross only one mile where there, were, where there was uh, mobile checkpoints during in Second Intifada. And they had, he had to, uh, to cross that one mile by donkey to get to the, another, to the other side and then get on the car again to um, his university. So such stories that we hear from Lama um, perhaps might not receive light or attention in scholarly works, but how do you, how would you approach such a story as a creative writer yourself? Uh, it's actually interesting because uh, more than ever, you realize how much of a colonial project uh, Israel is, you know, in uh, 
Kenya during in uh, uh the colonial during colonialism they put a whole bunch of uh, uh the, uh black people were fighting for independence in so called reserves in South Africa they had something called band stands but in the Kenyan reserves people were allowed to get out x amount of times and when they were allowed to get out what they used to do is they would kick whatever the food they could and they'll boil it together and stuff and there's a dish called mukim which is potatoes and and um vegetables and whatever and it's all mashed together because uh this is they ate for sustenance not for enjoyment um i do love that uh with palestine uh, uh in spite of everything that has happened you know the food is still really absolutely beautiful <laughs> and uh you know but it's it's also like when you see uh wild tiktok videos of zionists when you know uh they essentially take over like palestinian food and they claim that yes and the psych is then we enter your stealing i think uh zuki when we talked about asking you this question um i was expecting it to go in a direction but you took me by surprise right now because um it's exactly the expectation one would have when writing uh zuki you and i both write and we know the connections we make when we tell a story about say our own culture and then the typical reaction of readers is to react by telling us their stories from their perspectives which are common to what we're evoking in them and that's exactly what you did in response to this little clip that we just presented by lama where you started to speak about this other dish that you you know saw evolve and and basically you would you would be able to speak about that dish exactly like how lama did of hers so i just think this is really beautiful thank you zuki thank you Well, so I did want to go ahead and turn to you very quickly since you are at the intersection of both academic writing as well as creative writing. You have produced scholarly work as well as published two novels and several short stories. And how do you evaluate and assess the merit and value of the story we just heard? If you can expand more on that. Yes, absolutely. I think um I value both equally. Um I've been at many intersections in my life where I had to make a choice between the two because it was very hectic to be in both, to be wearing both hats. But in the end I just gave up because I realized that I need to have a foot in either um uh, feel for me to feel satisfied as an individual. Uh from a scholarly perspective it it requires that i engage with the subject in a certain direction and as a creative writer i engage uh, with the subject in a different in a completely different way and i think the two fields complement each other because um i feel that literature beyond academic writing which is very much about concepts uh, acad- creative writing provides the ability to assess um it's a sort of a call it a seismograph of the more moral understanding or the the moral um um uh you know tensions that a community experiences at any time and that's captured in literature because in literature in creative writing we don't have to always be very precise uh in what we're saying we don't have to be filled with jargon to express what we tr- what we want to express and very often emotions don't have names yet and they don't have labels and that's the very function for me of art of literature and that's why for me it complements scholarly writing thank you for that zuki sva i have come to know you through sva cross paths with you a few years ago when you edited her short story tara's hair This story was selected among many hundreds in the Afro Young Adult Short Story Competition and went on to be published in its original language English and translated into French and Swahili and sold across every continent. I will now read a synopsis and excerpt of that story uh, or which I found the most striking and memorable and Tara's hair as a synopsis follows Sophia, a young girl grappling with societal expectations and religious beliefs. After Tara, a school acquaintance and friend 
suffers a tragic accident that leaves her in a vegetative state. Sophia grapples with mortality and the implications of hair length on salvation. Through her diary entries, readers witness Sophia's reflections on death alongside her struggle to reconcile personal convictions with societal expectations. In this excerpt, Sophia begins to ruminate over the imminent death of her school friend, who has just been hospitalized after a tragic accident. And quote, one week since I have been thinking incessantly about death. 23rd of May, 2018. Diary entry. Dear Anne Frank, I've never imagined this kind of death. I've known old, sick people to expire like medicine, like food, and that implies they had run the course of existence, stayed on the shelf long enough, and then it was simply time to go because they had got spoiled for whatever reason. But this kind of death, never. This is something different. It's too sudden, unnatural, suspicious, mysterious. I guess that's why criminal investigators are always interested in such deaths. They're always trying to figure out why. Sometimes they find answers, sometimes they don't. So, yeah, close quote. So, Gisfa, what was striking or memorable for you about Tata's hair? I could be a decision, really, to just, like, cut off her hair and do away with everything that was expected of her. And, you know, the aunties uh, would be like, oh, yeah, you know, you're supposed to have long, luxurious hair and get married and so forth and so on. And how she actually refused to... uh, uh, stay within that little thing. But it was also, I think the other thing that was also very important was a child dealing with with loss. And I've been thinking, of course, about loss a lot. And I think this is where Tara says is more relevant, even more today than any other time. Because we're getting stories of like, children in, in in Gaza saying that they would rather be dead, you know. Uh because and 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 these are children who are seeing death every day. And you know, Sophia is coming to grips with death. You know, she's trying to understand it. But children in Gaza right now are constantly like they're seeing their beloved, they're being they're being child parents to their to their little sisters or brothers. They're, and, and, and I keep thinking, what must it be like, you know? Because you and I and Saba, we are suffering a certain level of trauma just from watching it. But what happened to the child on the ground, you know? How are they dealing with this, you know? And uh, and so you look at it, and of course the significance, obviously, of um, you know Anne Frank's diary because this was another child, and uh, somebody it's a weird thing because it came up in a conversation earlier this week, where it was like, is there some way where we can get an equivalent of Anne Frank's diaries sent to a whole bunch of uh, people, the equivalent of like Gazan children speaking, you know, uh, and and friends' diary. But I'm hoping that when this is over soon, uh, in addition to people obviously going to uh, prison, uh, going to ICC for their crimes against humanity, I'm hoping that there will be governments who will be uh, made to uh, pay for our collective mental health because we've been destroyed as a world. Thank you so much for those very thought-provoking words. For Sabah, I was intrigued by the references you made to the Holocaust, specifically, of course, on Frank's diary in this piece about the struggles of a young Indo-Mauritian Muslim adolescent. Can you tell us about what, what incited you to include this reference? Um, to go back to what Zuki said in her letter to, to Goethe Institute, um, you know, when we speak about never again, even as academics, we are familiar with the concept of saying not just never again, 
and not making it duplicitous and, and instead insisting on never again for anyone. And I think that's uh, something I can relate to very much. And I feel that when I look back now, when I was growing up as a Indo-Mauritian Muslim in, uh, in Mauritius, uh, I, I, was, I had access to the British Council Library and that is when I came across a copy of Anne Frank's diary, uh, the diary of Anne Frank. And um, that's when I made a connect with the character. That's when I really learned for the first time about the Holocaust. And of course, um, I was very much marked by what happened to Anne and her sister Margot. And of course, later in time, I learned about, you know, how Otto Frank, uh, you know, edited the diary to make it publishable. And of course, to remove certain parts that he was not very happy with. But my point is that I grew up in that environment and I learned about that idea that there are certain um, acts by human beings, unfortunately, that should be condemned no matter where we're from and no matter who we are. And I think that stayed with me. And I hope it does for the rest of my life, because I think it's an ethical imperative to abide by that principle in whatever we do. Thank you for that extension, Sabah. Um, do you have any more questions for Suki Star? Thank you, Luis. I do have a question for Zuki. Um, and the last question is, I am curious to know what you see there, Zuki, as a writer, as an artist, as a curator, and so many things. I want to know what we could do as writers uh, to help in the cause of Palestinians. During apartheid, uh, what happened is, and I, and I really believe that this is what caused the apartheid regime to fall. Um, there was a bunch of uh, people who decided, you know what, we are going to boycott South African products. We're going to disinvest. Uh, we're going to sanction South African companies. And this hurts the money people so much because always you need to hit capitalism where it hurts. This hurt the money people so much that they spoke to the apartheid government, you know. So they, you know, they then had to go on the negotiating table and say, guys, say, um, by the way, we are going to have to talk to our enemies. On Sunday last week, uh, exactly a week from today, I was um, I was in studio at South African Broadcasting Corporation. And, uh, you know, the question of my giving up the medal came up. And, uh, and I, I say, well, you know, I, I really couldn't be, uh, accept an honor from a country that had this position. And as I came out, uh, there were these guys, there was this guy who had come to promote their single and, you know, on, on television. And he said to me, ah, my sister, I said, yes. He said, let me show you this. And I'm going to read this letter that he showed me. Um, he had been invited, they'd been invited to Tempest, uh, to, to uh, the Orlando Fringe Festival in the US. And this is the letter that they wrote on March 7th. Dear Tempest, thank you for reaching out to us. I hereby inform that Swan and Osfokoina, Spirit of Africa, who unfortunately not participate in the Orlando Fringe Festival this year. The excitement for the event is dimmed by the ongoing support of the Israeli Gaza War by the United States. The continued sponsoring of the war by the United States and the visuals of women and children suffering as seen on TV is very disturbing. As people who experienced and suffered under an apartheid regime, we choose not to associate with a country that seems to be just as oppressive, killing innocent people, blocking a ceasefire, not allowing humanitarian aid to helpless women and children, uh, causing starvation and death. But we remain hopeful and pray for peace. Thank you for the opportunity. We are up to engage at a later stage under more peaceful circumstances. I read this to highlight 
that artists have a voice and uh, it's and in our having a voice, we actually can say something. And I've I've seen I've seen Irish uh, bands a lot of stuff. I have seen um, uh, many other places. So it's up to us. I've seen I've seen writers pull out of like uh Pan America's uh voices uh festival. People like Mazamingiste, people like Isabella Hammond. And we really, really need to use yeah. this place because this is the least we can do. But also we can also just the barest minimum download No Thanks app and Every time that we go into a shop and we're buying stuff, we can scan and we see whether this product is on the BDS list and we leave it, you know, and we find something, another alternative. So, yeah, that's what we can do. Thank you so much, Suzuki. Thank you so much for, for your time and for your words. And I hope that this will go out as a message uh, of encouragement and of hope as well to everyone out there. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. This was not to forgive, but to understand with our guest, Zuki Svavano. To our listeners, don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more discussions. If you would like to read Zuki Svav's essay, Vignettes of a People in an Apartheid State, you can find and purchase the essay on Amazon, where proceeds will be going to the Palestine Children's Relief Fund.